This will be a review of the Marvel Blade Vampire movie series Blade, Blade 2, Blade Trinity, and those uh, movies are based on the Marvel comic books about the war between the vampires and humans, uh, released starting in 1998 through 2004. Wesley Snipes' company co-produced it, and the name of that company is Amon Ra Productions, and Amon Ra is an Egyptian god. Before I go into the movies, just to recap about what the bloodliner Nicholas Devere wrote in Transylvania to Turnbridge, Wales, he said it is a common device to convey esoteric knowledge via the medium of supposed fiction. Also in the Realm of the Ringlords book, written by Freemason and Templar and historian Lawrence Gardner, he lists the genealogy as Mother Dragon, then the Anunnaki in Assyria, then to the Pharaohs, and on down to the Vampires and then to the current royalty. And that relates to this movie series. And the series fits into my bloodliners depicted as vampires in movies for several reasons. Number one, it ties vampires to the elite overlords in the first movie. And by the last movie, it ties them right back to the ancient Babylon where Nephilim of the Bible originated. Uh, number two is vampires and those working with them are all marked in this movie series with beast system tattoos. Number three, it focuses on ancient Assyrian glyphs and summoning rituals of parent gods in the vampire pantheon. Because see, the pagans favor a Babylonian approach to spirituality, religion, and religious terminology. Number four is the seed war. Blade keeps a plant as a shrine in his home, which they show over and over. And in the movies, they really focus on it. And this is it. And it's called an ersatz hybrid plant. And it's a juxtaposition of two species from disparate lineages. Its leaves and roots are of a Dracenia, representing the serpent, dragon, and vampire race, with flowers um, of the Lorospermum, which are hybrids stuck around the base. And number five is the reference to bloodliners as vampire purebloods, elders, the ancient ones, and the old gods, which is very Nephilim overtones. Also, in all the movies, there's an obsession with needles. They keep injecting stuff into Blade uh, that will make him stronger, which is uh, more bioengineering and transhumanism references. So in summary, I think this and other movies and forms of art are meant to in inject our consciousness now that we're moving into the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and this movie is a great example of that. So Blade is a what they call a dampier, which is the result of a union between a vampire and a human, and this union was usually between male and female vampires, which sounds very Nephilim. He's portrayed as the protagonist and a superhero, the light side of the dark world, so to say. The next one is Deacon Frost, and he's the bad vampire, or the antagonist in the first movie. He's an upstart vampire and enemy of Blade, and his character from the comic book is a former preacher with superhuman abilities in mind control, medicine, physics, and chemistry. These being other themes that we see in the Vampire Mythos and with Knights of the Crown, which I go into in the playlist titled Knights of the Crown. The next one is Adam Whistler and Adam, I'm sorry, Abraham Whistler. And Abraham is a reference to the human race. He makes weapons for Blade. The next one is Dragonetti. And Dragonetti is the pureblood vampire elder. And he's the leader of the council house of Erubus. And Erubus, in Greek mythology, is the personification of darkness and the offspring of Kronos. Erubus is also used to refer to the darkness of the underworld. The etymology is Sanskrit. And the only one in this movie that I could find uh, with historical ties to the bloodliners is Domi Dominico Dragonetti, this person here. And he was a musician who played for the King's Theatre in the 1800s in London. And it's definitely fitting into our theme 
similar to William Laws in The Only Lovers Left Alive movie, who was also a Victorian-era mu England musician for the Bloodliners. Um, the set is initially uh, set in Los Angeles, and Blade's mother is a human female and is impregnated by a vampire and makes Blade, who is a half-human, half-vampire. And in the first movie, the main antagonist, Bad Vampire, Deacon Frost, is trying to bring back La Magra. And La Magra is the patron deity of vampires. And this bringing back is to fulfill a dark prophecy involving twelve volunteers, or the spirit of the twelve, having more biblical references to the twelve disciples. And they say over and over that the myth of the cross warding off vampires does nothing. So they are trying to resurrect the, the this blood god by using an archive of ancient texts that contain pages from the Vampire Bible, Eridus, Book of Erebus, which look like Sanskrit, with glyphs in their large pages, which reminds me of the Sumerian cuneiform tablets, the ones lost or stolen in the Kurnaw disaster. And Deacon Frost is trying to decrypt them with a computer 3D image of the program that looks like a key, but it looks exactly like CERN, so he's trying to or open up a portal to another dimension to bring back his patron god, and that key is, um, and the key to that is Blade's blood. And the theory in the Truth or Community is that CERN is a Stargate using quantum physics to open a portal. Frost is in opposition to the pure blood vampires, which are the elite vampires and thousands of years old and represented by houses. And you can't see this very well, but this is them sitting all around their big table, and they, you know, um, are influencing everyone. They talk about them having offshore accounts, owning the police, being everywhere, including finance, politics, and real estate. Which, doesn't that sound familiar? Of course, on their set, there's a chessboard. Also on this set, you have this um, Egyptian crocodile deity in the Frost House. His name is Amit. They have a Hindu goddess in the Frost House. And so in the movie, Blade is subdued and taken to the Temple of Eternal Night, where Frost plans to perform the summoning ritual for La Magra, the primordial or parent blood god. And the in this temple, there are these ancient ancestors all around, carved in stone there. And they look like a cross between Akhenaten, aliens, and pharaohs. And kind of like what you would imagine those ancient Aryan pre-flood gods would look like. And the temple itself looks like CERN as well. Um, which this temple is what was represented on the software that Frost was using. And this is not them uh, in the movie. They look a little bit different. This is, an, they look more alien, but this is just a photo from a Marvel comic book, I think. So then in Blade 2... It begins with this statement, Forget what you think you know, vampires exist. So that plot involves El Dem Damaskinos, and this is him, and he's an ancient head vampire king who's referred to as an overlord, which is an ancient reference to the vampire-like creatures that we've talked about, and is described by Devere in his Transylvania to Turnbridge Wells writing, and Damaskinos is Blade's nemesis in the second movie. Damaskinos and his children and others have mutated into a more monstrous type that feed on other vampires along with humans. And the way they were created is because the official health agency purposefully created a pandemic called the Reaper Strain. And Damaskinos becomes obsessed with creating a new race that is superior and resistant to death by using DNA in cloned fetuses. And I thought he's probably um, named Damaskinos after uh, Nicholas of Damascus, which is a Greek historian and philosopher that lived during the Augustan age of the Roman Empire and was intimate friends with King Herod during the time of Jesus. And he has a male and female child referred to as prince and princess, and all of them have Masonic-looking rings, which is apparently a family ring. And in the movie, they really focus on the fact that these vampires have these rings, but they never really show it as Masonic. They just allude to it several times. So the female princess takes Blade's side, even though she's Damaskino's daughter, and this is because she realizes that her father is only using her for his evil purpose, using his own children, which also sounded familiar.
And in the movie, there's a medication they take called EDTA, which is a real medication, and it's used in the management and treatment of heavy metal toxicity, which I believe to be a mixing of iron clay reference. Part of the movie takes place in Prague, and they keep showing um, this uh, infamous Prague astronomical clock. And uh, it was constructed during the 1400s, and it's based on the geocentric model. So I thought that was interesting. Other symbolism includes a huge sun on the wall and this vampire club that they have. But uh, the one that blew me away was the keyhole that this Damas you know, takes his bath in. He takes a blood bath. Um, you can't see it that well here, but trust me, this thing is shaped like a keyhole. You can see it in the movie from the back. And when he goes in, he asks this question. He says, recognize this as if he's speaking directly to the audience because there's nobody else there and it's super creepy. And the reason that really struck me is that, well, for one thing, this is Mithras behind here and Sol Invictus in this relief. But the keyhole symbolism is seen in the occult in ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and elsewhere. We're going to look at that. And I found that the meaning and purpose of the keyhole is a type of sigil or sacred geometry having to do with uniting the unseen spiritual realm with the physical realm of Earth. And it's also depicted as a magnetic field from Saturn to Earth and a pillar of light in the cosmic tree. And here you will see it along with... Um, the Babylonian Star of Ishtar, which has eight points. It's on the Seal of Solomon sigil. See it here. It's used in the Kabbalah. The Ankh represents a keyhole, and it's found on the Cosmology Star Map layout at Hoover Dam, which I have another video that shows that. But it's also found in the Vatican City Courtyard, which also has the Star of Ish Ishtar depicted with the eight points one two three four five six seven eight and in the end after the king and the prince and princess die blade and one of the surviving vampires are in london and they're in some strip club type place and one of the vampires pays and he puts his money on the counter and it focuses in on the money which has queen lizzie on it and then right beside that um, pound note, it focuses on a key, like an old-timey one. And it really, like, zeroes in and focuses on it, and that's the end of the movie. Which is telling because of the way the third Trinity movie begins, and that is, um, in the beginning of the movie, there's a narrator that s says, in the movies they tell you that Dracula wears a cape and some old English guy manages to save the day with crosses and holy water, but everyone knows the movies are full of it. The truth is, it all started with Blade, and it ended with him, and the rest of us are just along for the ride. And remember, Blade is the result of the union between a vampire and a human, which is a very Nephilim. So in the beginning of Blade Trinity, it pans to the Syrian desert, where they immediately show a ziggurat that looks like the Tower of Babel. And this is it. And it's supposed to be a group of vampires uh, in that scene, but it appears as a military operation. So they go down into the ziggurat, which is filled with cuneiform, and they find an ancient tomb of a first vampire named Drake, or Dagon, who is the Assyrian god from their pantheon, and when they open it up, he gets out. And the Syrian desert is in Iraq, encompassing Assyrian Babylon, and isn't that where Desert Storm was? That where people say the military was looking for Nimrod? Um... Drake was the progenitor of the vampire race, Hominus Nocturne, which is Latin for vampire, born around the 5th or 4th millennium BC in the cradle of civilization of ancient Sumer and Mesopotamia. And over the millennia, vampires sired by Drake de-evolved because their bloodlines were diluted as they bred. And he was worshipped by the Babylonians as Dagon. And as the centuries passed, he eventually became known as Dracula. And that's all. Thanks for listening.